Yeah. So, hello. Hello and welcome. So first of all, I just want to say thank you to everyone for coming in on your lunch hour. And I am thrilled to be able to have Meg Clovis join us. So I'm going to read a little bit about Meg, if I find my sheet that I had. Hold on one second. Can we hear you there? Pardon? Let me go. Oh, look, the mysterious hand came out the door. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So come on in. We're about ready to get started. So I just want to read a little bit to you about Meg Clovis, who is joining us and who is actually the presenter today. So Meg Clovis, Clovis has served as Cultural Affairs Manager for the Monterey County Parks Department since 1981. She is active in Monterey County's Museum and Historic Preservation Communities, serving as staff to the County's Historical Advisory Commission and H Historic Resources Review Board liaison to the Monterey County Agricultural and Rural Life Museum, and serves on the Historic Resources Board for the City of Salinas. Meg received her BA in Art History from Mills College, followed by an MA in Preservation Studies from Boston University, with an emphasis on American architectural history. She has written two books on Monterey County history, The Salinas Valley and Monterey County's North Coast. So Meg actually did this presentation for Ag Knowledge. That's where I saw it. And I wanted to bring this to have my staff see it. Um, just to let you know that the Ag Knowledge Program is an executive leadership training program, and I'm really thrilled to be able to be a part of that this year. So without further ado, I'm going to man the video, and Meg's going to speak. Thank you. Thanks. So um, as Gail mentioned, uh, this is a pro uh, program that I do every year for Ag Knowledge. And so it's focused on agricultural history of the Salinas Valley. And, um, and in this particular presentation, I have many, many different presentations. But with this particular one, I'm going to be focusing a lot of the people who contributed to um, agriculture in the county. So um, okay, first one. So uh, agriculture actually started with a, a mission system here in California. And this is one of our missions, Mission San Antonio. It was the third in the mission chain. It was founded in 1771. And the reason I'm showing you this mission out of all the other missions here in uh, the county is because this had the most sophisticated agricultural production system. The reason it did is it because they had built um, of, it had actually the most sophisticated irrigation system of any mission in California. So next. So who built the irrigation system? Who built the missions? It was in that particular case, it was the Salinan Indians. And so this is a photo of Gabriel Fontes. Am I, is it is okay? Okay, Gabriel Fontes. Um, he was a mission Indian at the San Antonio Mission. And next. So um, the Spanish Empire lost um, uh, California to Mexico in 1843. And uh, Mexico brought in a lot of changes to California. Prior to um, Mexico coming to California, all the ports in California were closed to trade. But they opened the ports to trade. So that was a huge difference. They also secularized the missions, which broke up the huge holdings of the of the missions, and then those the lands were available as land grants to people who applied. So a lot of them were um, Mexican soldiers. So if the ports were opened, what were they going to trade? Uh, they traded, um, they uh, raised beef cattle. Well, it wasn't beef cattle then. It was just plain old cattle, half wild cattle. And they um, raised them for hides and tallow. So they traded... Um, to South America, Eastern Seaboard, and the Orient. And next. So opening the ports also opened California to settlers. Now, not so much in Monterey County. In um, 1862, there was only 4,700 people living here. 
So there weren't, weren't many people coming here. Most of the people were going for gold. So they were going up to the northern mines. But there were some people who decided to come here. Um, this is the Pinkerton adobe down at, um, which was actually underwater now. It's uh, under Lake San Antonio. But um, they came here from Australia. And they came principally to raise sheep. There was a huge market for wool in the 1860s because of uh, the Civil War. They needed war, uh, wool for um, their uniforms. So the Pinkerton family came here from Australia. They um, built this adobe, and they started uh, raising both beef and sheep. So next. This is a photo of a roundup on the Pinkerton Ranch. Even though these people weren't going to the mines, they were probably making more money on beef than they were at the, at the mines. So to give you an idea of this, um, cattle prices rose in a period of two years from $2 a head to $75 a head. There was a huge demand for beef up in Sac San Francisco, Sacramento, and so Monterey County was a, a huge beef cattle county. It was one of the largest beef cattle counties in California. And so they drive the cows up through the Salinas Valley all the way up to San Francisco. Unfortunately, and this will be a recurring theme in um, my talk today, there was a terrific drought in the 1860s. And um, it wiped out the, the cattle industry, the sheep industry as well. There was just no feed for the cattle. They weren't feeding them. They were just dependent on rangeland. And so, next. So the farmers had to figure out, what are we going to do next? I mean, clearly cattle's not the answer. So they decided to try dry farming. But they needed a market for dry farming, a place that they could ship their grain. And so here comes Captain Charles Moss, that you may know from Moss Landing. And he built a port in the 1860s. And this is a picture of his port. He built the, uh, the docks. And you can see in the background all those storehouses, those warehouses. And people would um, bring their grain, principally from Pajaro Valley, Salinas Valley, principally around Salinas, for here, here to, for shipment up to San Francisco. And um, next. So um, there were other ways of getting the grain to Moss Landing besides taking it in wagons. You, if you think of it a long time ago, Salinas was ringed by sloughs. And some of them were navigable. And so you could actually take one of these boats. They're called a lighter. It's a flat bottom boat, and you could pull it through these sloughs from Salinas all the way to Moss Landing. So this is Hudson's Landing. It's on Elkhorn Slough, and you can see that they're loading the boat full of sacks of grain, and they're headed off to Moss Landing to ship this grain. So next. So there was a, you needed a lot of labor for grain farming. Um, during harvest, they would maybe bag 1,100 uh, sacks of grain a day. So you needed people to do this. And next. And so what were the first, who were the first people who worked on our, our grain uh, farms here in Monterey County? It was the Chinese. Now, the Chinese originally came to California um, to seek their fortunes during the gold rush, just like so many other people. But like so many other people, they did not find pay dirt, but they still needed jobs. So next. So they were picked up uh, by the railroad, SP Railroad, and they became the principal um, uh, workforce for the railroads, about 10,000 men in total. But once that last spike was driven, what are they going to do? Well, they needed jobs again, so they were hired to work in the, in the grain fields here in Monterey County as well as throughout California. And next. So this is a picture of, of Lin Shi and his wife. Um, the Chinese population was growing. They started um, constructing Chinatowns. The third largest Chinatown in California was in Pajaro. And we also had a Chinatown here in um, Salinas. We had one in Castroville as well. So they were establishing communities, and they'd bring picture brides, like this is um, his picture bride here. Um, he was known as Shorty 
the mayor of Salinas's Chinatown. And next, this is the Salinas's Chinatown in about uh, 1914. You can see there's a big flood. That's the edge of Carr Lake, looking out towards Toro. Uh, the original Salinas Chinatown was right under this uh, the overpass here and on North Main, and it burned down in 1898, and so Eugene Sherwood gave the property for this new Chinatown. So um, the Chinese community was growing, and, um, and they started leasing some of the swamp land that was uh, surrounding Salinas, and they would drain that swamp land, and then they could plant on that swamp land. So before long, the Chinese were farming about 10,000 acres in the Salinas Valley. And next. So again, transportation's always been real key to agricultural production, and you saw Moss Landing, but eventually the SP got down here, Southern Pacific, in 1872. It reached Salinas. This is the Salinas Depot. And um, so all the farmers started bringing their grain here for shipment. So to um, give you uh, an idea of how much grain was shipped here, in, by 1877, 250 tons of grain was hauled to this depot every day. So it was huge. It was, the production was huge. Um, Monterey County was one of the largest grain-producing counties in California. So um, the, there were um, warehouses all around here, and the grain was stacked 20 um, feet high. So next. In the next year, 1873, the train reached uh, Soledad. So this picture of Soledad. And this is a traditional way of that the farmers would haul their grain to the depot for shipping. And uh, Soledad remained the, um, the end of the line for some time until 1886 when, and next, the train reached King City. So this is King City. This is a look down Broadway. Um, so farmers, this started opening up more of Monterey County, the southern um, valleys. And uh, farmers, again, would bring their grain. If you look all the way down Broadway, you'll see that, oh, there, there's a clicker, good. There's that warehouse down there. That's the SP Milling Company. Every single town along the railroad had an SP Milling Company, and that's where the farmers would bring their grain. Now, with this milling company, John Steinbeck's father was the first agent. So, as I said, this started opening up land to some smaller farmers, because Monterey County was pretty much held by very large growers. But with the Homestead Act, um, people could, uh, pr well, they proved up on 160 acre sections. And they had to just, all they had to do was make some prescribed improvements. And one of those prescribed improvements was to build a house. And it just said, it had the dimensions of the house that you were supposed to build, but it didn't say whether it was feet or inches. And so people were putting up these tiny little structures. So, there, so mostly um, the um, farms were still held in these really, really large, uh, it was a holdover from the land grants. And so these uh, farming operations were huge. This is a, a harvesting scene, a grain harvesting scene. And next, so down in uh, the southern Salinas Valley, there were a lot of people coming in. That's one place that they could get um, land, uh, homestead land. And so people, if you are familiar with the southern Monterey County, there's Paris Valley. That's called Paris Valley because the French settled there. There was a whole contingent from uh, a little island off of Germany called the Isle of Fur. And so there was that whole contingent there, a German contingent. And then there were people like the Pattersons, who you see here, who came across the Oregon Trail. And next. So this, this photo is um, a photo of the Pattersons building their house. It's out in Lockwood. It's still standing. And um, there, were, there was not a lot of lumber. Most lumber came from Santa Cruz. It was very expensive to ship lumber from Santa Cruz. 
all the way down to South County. So people were building adobe buildings again, just like they did during the Mexican era and Spanish era. But they did a different construction technique. They did rammed earth adobes rather than using the adobe blocks. And there's probably still about 30 rammed earth adobes down in South County from this era. So Monterey County attracted a lot of different settlers by this time. We're talking 1870s, 1880s. And one of the largest contingents were, were Swiss Italians. This is um, Leopoldo Giacometti. And he's pictured here with his family. His story is like a lot of people's stories, a lot of Swiss Italian stories. Most people came from Canton to Chino. He came in 1867. And um, he started working as a laborer at a, at a dairy. And then eventually he was able to lease 800 acres uh, where he grew grain. And then in 1902, he was able to uh, purchase his own land where he started dairy farming. Next. This is Gonzales, uh, Main Street. And uh, the principal dairies in Monterey County uh, centered on Gonzales and Soledad. It was a huge Swiss Italian area. And one, um, one quote we have from an old timer was, in Gonzales, the Swiss ran the bank and the hotel. The garage was Swiss, the store was Swiss, and there was pretty near all Swiss around there. If you talk Swiss, everyone would understand you. Next. So this is Celestino Paluca. He's holding his son's hand right there. And his story, again, was very much like everybody else's. He worked as a hired hand for 15 years. And then um, eventually he was able to uh, buy land to open a dairy. So the dairy workers, uh, on average, they'd milk 20 cows per person seven days a week. And it was always said that the only time they had off was when they quit. So these are some milkers here. Um, they made 30 to $40 per month, and they also got room and board. Um, and after they milked their cows in the morning, they'd work in the fields, and then they'd milk the cows again. I just wanted to point out one thing that they brought from, um, from the old country with them, and that's the one-legged milking stool. You'll see this one guy, he's holding the one-legged milking stool, and some of them have them strapped around their waist. This is very convenient, because you could milk a cow anywhere. Just sit down, milk the cow. So next. So this is where they milked the cows, in these muddy corrals. So if a cow was unruly, the guy with the lasso, that's why he's holding it, they would lasso the cow and tie it to the fence. And then they milked into these five-gallon buckets, and then next, and then took it to what was known as the milk factory. Every dairy had what was a milk factory. And you think of factory, large building. No, these were tiny little buildings where they'd made uh, butter and cheese. And so the dairy farmer, no milk in Monterey County was really sold as milk. It was all processed and then made into butter and cheese and shipped up to San Francisco. And so um, the dairymen weren't the only people who were working. There were dairy wives as well, and they had to cook you know, several meals a day for, for all the hands. They watched the kids, fed the chickens, had the vegetable garden, and were often out milking cows as well. So the dairy business in Monterey County uh, changed dramatically in 1907. And this is when the first creamery opened. This is the creamery in uh, Castroville. And so this took all the milk production off the farm. So now, instead of making the butter and the cheese on the farm, the creamery would make it. And they also took over marketing as well. So this is a, a photo of the inside of a creamery. So huge churns, and we have one of these churns down at San Lorenzo Park. But you would churn up the butter, you can see the butter inside, and then it was packed in these wooden pails, and everything was shipped up to San Francisco. When the um, dairymen delivered their milk to the creameries, each uh, dairy had a number. So you can see these milk pails are numbered, 18, there's 20. That indicated which dairy the milk came from. And next... 
Also in 1907, there was a, another big uh, change in the dairy industry, and this is when the first real factory in Monterey County opened. This is the Alpine um, Evaporated Milk Company, and uh, they bought, there were 5,000 cows just around in a five-mile rate, or 7,000 cows in a five-mile radius around that factory, and they bought the milk from all those cows. Another technological advance is the Delaval milker. So now uh, you could, well, first of all, the cow is no longer in a muddy corral. The cow is in a milking parlor. And uh, you could milk an amazing amount of cows in um, short order. So it, you could do 200 cows in three hours with one of these machines. So it, it really changed up the, the industry. However, they're not giving up their one-legged milking stool. You can see that they, um, they still have that. So probably the biggest influence on Salinas Valley agriculture was the opening of the Spreckles Sugar Beet Factory in 1898. This had, on every single level, uh, in terms of, of labor and immigration, and water had a huge effect on Monterey County. So Spreckles um, was the largest sugar factory in the world. So you can sort of see how there's this recurring theme in Monterey County. So we had, you know, the large, we were the largest grain growing county. And then we were the uh, largest uh, beef cattle county. And now we're the largest sugar beet county. So, um, this remained the largest sugar beet factory in the world for 60 years. So this is another um, view of the factory. I just want to point out, you can see the little town of Spreckles just beginning to grow in the far corner. And to give you some idea of uh, just how huge this, this enterprise was, is that every day they'd use 13 million gallons of water to process 3,000 tons of beet, beets, and out of that they got 450 pounds of raw sugar. Huge amount. So the factory workers, Klaus Spreckels himself was German, and so he made a big point of hiring German and, da and also Danish workers. This um, painter was Danish. He, in fact, founded a whole separate colony, St. Joseph's Colony, outside of Salinas just for German Catholics to work in his factory. So in, at the factory, um, Klaus Speckles was the first uh, person to provide housing for his workers. So the single men were housed here at the Speckles Hotel. And I just want to point out here um, the baby walnut trees. You're probably all familiar with the grown walnut trees now, but here are the baby walnut trees. And then there was a hierarchy of um, levels of housing. So if you're familiar with uh, Spreckles, there's the tiny little houses, bigger, bigger, bigger. And it depended what job you had at the factory, what house you would get. So here's low man on the totem pole. Average uh, factory worker who is um, sweeping the floor here. And he, um, this uh, person, would, during the campaign, which the campaign is when they process the sugar beets, he would work 12-hour um, days, seven days a week, and make 16 cents an hour. So in the German tradition, uh, each employee got a pint of beer at noon and in the afternoon. This tradition was continued until it was discovered that the supervisors were sneaking extra beer. And so beer breaks were totally eliminated and the quality of the work from the supervisors improved. <laughs> so, so this is um, ranch number three. This is down in King City and, and this is just a real good illustration of what a huge operation this was. This is at the beet dump. And so what what would happen is the sugar beets would be harvested, they'd be put in these uh, wagons, and the wagons would go up this ramp, and then actually the side of the wagon would fall away and dump into the rail car. 
Then the rail car would go up to the factory for uh, processing the beads. So um, Spreckles, of course, had factory workers, and, he, and they also had field workers. They had 11 ranches in the Salinas Valley. And so um, because uh, of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1886, it cur curtailed um, Chinese immigration. And so it was almost like cutting off your nose to spite your face. They still needed workers, and so they turned to Japan. And so Sparkles brought in the first Japanese workers to the Salinas Valley, 200 Japanese workers who you see here. And he provided housing for not only the factory workers, but for the field workers as well. So this is a typical labor camp. This is uh, in Spreckles, or was in Spreckles. You can see it's on the other side of the tracks. But um, he, there were 45 labor camps just for Spreckles employees alone in Salinas Valley. So the Japanese um, pretty much followed the same trajectory as the Swiss Italians. Here they started out as um, laborers, and then eventually were, worked their way up to be sharecroppers, and then finally into um, property owners. Um, the, the Japanese introduced celery and broccoli to the Salinas Valley, and they were also the first to grow strawberries as well. Um, the first strawberry uh, plot was on Romy Lane. That's when Romy Lane was still the country. And that was established in 1911. So this is a very interesting photograph. Um, Sparkles needed people to grow beets for him. And so they had this, he made this deal with the Salvation Army to bring people, the urban poor from San Francisco, down to a colony called Fort Romy Colony. It's outside of Soledad. This is a photo of the first colonists. And for those of you who know the Los Coches Adobe on the Arroyo Seco turnoff of Highway 101, this is the only photograph I know of of the interior of the Los Coches Adobe. That's where they all stayed while they were waiting for their houses to be built at um, Fort Romy. So this is an uh, example of what they note, prosperous colonists. Each colonist got a 10-acre um, parcel. They were given sugar beet seed, tools, um, a few livestock, and they had about 10 years to pay this off. But if you were joining Fort Romy, you also had to uh, sign a pledge that you were not going to drink any alcohol at all. No alcohol. Totally dry. So you saw in the last slide the little notation, prosperous colonists. Unfortunately, they were anything but prosperous. California was going through another drought. This was in 19, 1898. They had no water. How are you going to grow sugar beets with, without water? And they also had no experience. These were the urban poor. They basically took people from the city, plopped them on the land, and said, grow sugar beets. So uh, Fort Romy became known as Fort Ruin and uh, didn't last a year. But the Salvation Army said, never say die, and we're going we're gonna to try this again. But they got local folks, they got the Swiss Italians to move in. And so they had a little town here. It was a cooperative store, and there was a social hall on top. That building is still standing. Next door, you could buy ice cream and cigars. Interesting combo, but it was an ice cream cigar store, and then the uh, last building that you see is, was the blacksmith. So here are some, this is the Pura family, um, some of the Swiss Italians who moved into Fort Romy. You can see how small the houses were, and there's a sort of, that's Colony Road going up there, and there's a little gate. It says Salvation Army Fort Romy. But the Swiss Italian said, said we're not going to make any money growing sugar beets on 10 acres. Let's go with the cows. So even if they're in the front yard, we're going with the cows. So here you can see them. Um, the biggest contribution probably that Spreckles brought, we can, we can keep going, okay, was uh, Spreckles brought the first large scale, scale irrigation to Monterey County. This is one of his pumping plants. There were many experiments. I mean, everybody knew water was a problem. 
everybody knew. And so the experiments in irrigation started about 1870, but it wasn't really on a large scale. Spreckles had the money to really make it large scale. And so really opened up, I mean, changed the face of this whole valley. And next. So he moved water through these trussel systems. This is a trussel in King City. And next. And also there was a, a miles and miles of canals that moved water to crops. So sort of building on this idea of water and irrigation, um, there was a uh, real estate developer who said, hey, you know, I can, um, I can build a whole new community if I just bring water. And so he built an irrigation system tapping into the Arroyo Seco River and um, held a lottery in San Francisco to sell lots. And so you could buy um, lots, uh, 10 to 20 acre parcels, for $37.50 an acre. And so 400 lucky families from San Francisco were able to buy this property. They were mostly Swiss and Danish, and they moved on to what was known as Clark Colony, which we now know as Greenfield. So by um, World War I, 20% of the Salinas Valley's population were immigrants from Italy, Switzerland, and Germany. And next. So one of the surprising factors that they found out in Greenfield is that it was perfect for fruit culture, specifically apples. They had a lot of almonds. They had apricots, peaches. It was great. But people had their eye on this. In fact, one big company from the California Orchard Company from Ventura. And they came up and bought 8,000 acres uh, that's right between Greenfield and King City and created the Salinas Land Company. So they, they grew, oh geez, well it was 8,000 acres of orchards. If you can think about it now, when you drive that stretch of 101, there's not one fruit tree there. But it was just a whole different landscape. The other thing I want to note to you, um, this is all in 1917, but if you look behind the fruit tree, the low-growing crop, that's King City pink beans. So that's the first introduction of the pink bean to Monterey County, and it was a huge market because it was World War I. So um, the California Orchard Company had sharecroppers. This is the Herbert family um, who were some of their sharecroppers. But the reason I'm showing you this photograph is the California Orchard Company, Salinas Land Company, brought the eucalyptus to the Salinas Valley. So they had huge nurseries where they grew baby eucalyptuses and planted them as windbreaks up and down the valley. So it was to protect their, their apple trees, basically. Now they're beginning to disappear again. So they provided uh, housing for their workers as well. Um, this is the dormitory for single men at the land company. Um, OK, so now we're moving north up to Castroville, up to Castroville. And um, Andrew Malera is credited with uh, bringing artichokes to the Castroville area. He brought shoots from Half Moon Bay. And um, he planted some, had some success. And um, before long, um, there were, by 1922, two Italian farmers bought 150 acres, planted them to artichokes, very successful. So before long, the Italians dominated the industry. In just four years, 50 growers cultivated 12,000 acres of artichokes. So this is just a photograph of them packing the artichokes. This is near the Castroville Depot. And next. And then um, in 1924, the Pieri, Del Ciero, Totino, and Bologna families formed the California Artichoke and Vegetables Growers Corporation, and they're now Ocean Mist Farms. So in 1915, Mose Hutchins planted 15 acres of lettuce in the Pajaro Valley. Two years later, Orrin Eaton introduced it to the Salinas Valley. So the um, development of the ice-bunkered refrigerator car in 1923 made it possible to ship lettuce 
to other points in California as well as back east. So it was referred to as green gold and other uh, vegetable crops were introduced as well. Now this was all made possible because of Spreckles. He introduced irrigation. These row crops would not have been possible without that irrigation. So the lettuce started crowding out dairies and sugar beets. And by May 1928, 230 cars were sh of lettuce were shipped in one day. So lettuce catapulted uh, the valley into prosperous times. You have to remember this is the eve of the Depression, but it hardly even touched Salinas. Um, so they, uh, the 300 acres of lettuce planted in 1920 jumped to 40,000 acres by 1930. Salinas became the economic center for lettuce in California, and, it, and Salinas had the largest bank deposits per capita in the United States. However, not everybody was so lucky. Um, following the stock market crash, Midwest families were hit hard, and of course it was the Dust Bowl. And so they heard about California, just glowing reports of agricultural prosperity, and so they decided to pack up and move west. So when they arrived, though, they uh, found a highly industrialized agricultural economy. There was really no place for the small farmer. This is a photograph of a grandmother and her grandson in Greenfield. Uh, they rented this one room cabin that came with a, a, a bedstead and an iron bed and electric light for $10 a month. One tenant farmer from Texas who was living in the brush with six children said, you can make it here if you sleep slots and eats little. During the 1930s, 3,500 Midwesterners came to the Salinas Valley. And they camped beside roads and on the outskirts of towns. Some lived in labor camps. Others were able to rent a small house. Many found uh, jobs in the packing houses. Uh, one lettuce trimmer recalled that he made 30 cents an hour. Women made 25 cents an hour. And they worked sometimes 18-hour days. So many of the people settled in what we now know as the Alisal. They could buy a lot here um, with no gas, water, or electricity uh, for $200, and they had four years to pay. Other people, Midwesterners, chose uh, Aromas, Prunedale, and Pajaro. But meanwhile, um, anti now we saw the anti-Chinese sentiment, now the anti-Japanese sentiment was uh, on the rise. And in 1924, Japanese laborers were prohibited from immigrating to the US. So of course, agriculture still needed labor, laborers. So where did they go? They decided to go to the Philippines, a US territory. Filipino workers were paid 25 cents an hour. They felt this wage was discriminatory. In 1933, they formed the Filipino Farm Labor Union, and it was one of the first farm labor unions in, the, in California. In 1934, they led several strikes against lettuce growers. This particular photo is from a 1936 strike. This is a convoy of lettuce trucks. You can see there's armed guards on top of the lettuce trucks. They're rolling through Salinas. The newspaper re reported, uh, the roadsides are filled with crowds of agitated pickets. Tensions are high. The fuse is lit, and the situation explodes. So in 1934, Although Filipinos had the same rights as American citizens, immigration was restricted and they were banned from becoming U.S. citizens. Also in 1941, by then the Japanese were, who were here, they were doing very well and 40% of all California truck crops were raised by Japanese farmers. But that same year, December 7th, 1941, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and the U.S. declared war on Japan. In April 1942, Executive Order 9066 ordered all Japanese on the West Coast to evacuate their homes. 3,800 Central Coast residents of Japanese descent assembled at the Salinas Armory, which you see here. This is the front lawn. In the Salinas Valley, the, uh, strawberry, uh, the strawberry industry was virtually wiped out because it was dominated by Japanese growers. 
So the Japanese were moved to the Rodeo grounds in Salinas, where they stayed uh, for several months, and eventually uh, they were transferred to internment camps in Arizona. So this is the war. You know, the wheels still needed turning. There was not a lot of labor. Women were brought in to run uh, the Spreckles factory. So women were in all different departments. Um, they were really, they, they even brought uh, some uh, soldiers in to help run the factory. They, it was said that if you um, judges were um, telling people that they had to work in factories rather than um, you know, going to jail. So uh, they brought Indians off of reservations and also, next, they also had German prisoners of war and Italian prisoners of war working in the sugar beet fields here. So labor was still a big issue. It was very short supply. So in 1942, Mexico and the U.S. signed the Mexican Farm Labor Program Agreement, also known as the Bracero Program. And this agreement brought Mexican farm workers to the U.S. for limited periods of time. By the time the program was canceled in 1964, an estimated 4.6 million contracts had been awarded. There were 3,000 braceros in the Spreckles fields alone. This is a photo of the welcome dinner for the first 500 um, Braceros at Spreckles. So during this time, a new crop was introduced to the Salinas Valley. It looked like this. It looks like sagebrush, but this is known as Wayuli. It was a rubber plant. And there was a big um, rubber plant um, that was uh, five miles south of Salinas where uh, this rubber was produced. In 1943, um, this mill produced 880,000 pounds of rubber. And by 1944, they were in full production, and it was a major source of rubber during World War II. This is a picture, or the last picture. This is a picture of uh, some of the Wyuli scientists. If you know where the USDA offices are right now, those, that was the old Wyuli uh, production facility. And the, the Wyuli um, workers were housed here in Camp McCollum. Um, 1,000 braceros stayed here, and they were charged $1.20 per day for room and board and earned 65 cents an hour. So Salinas continued to grow after the close of World War II, so I'm only going up to World War II. We're almost done. Um, the first planned shopping center in California, the Valley Shopping Center, opened in 1947. And between 1950 and 1956, the size of the city doubled through annexations. I just want to point out in this picture that the building on the far left, um, that, that's the Dick Bruin building that just burned. It was a Montgomery Ward at, at this time. OK, next. So. By 1952, the Salinas Valley supplied 70% of the nation's fresh lettuce, as well as artichokes, celery, carrots, and cauliflower. To give you an idea of the magnitude of the Salinas Valley agricultural production, production, a 1955 article in the Scientific Monthly said, the average yearly production of 22,000 carloads of lettuce for the last 10 years would form an eight-foot wide blanket of lettuce encircling the world. So that form of picture I should have mentioned. The, um, in 1963, the one millionth car of lettuce was, was shipped from the Salinas Depot. Okay. So in 1845, Walter Colton wrote, the most fertile lands in California lie along the margin of the Salinas. These and other insular spots may be made perfect gardens. And William Brewer, who did the first maps of the Salinas Valley, who labeled the Salinas Valley the Salinas Desert, did say that with water, the Salinas Valley could be finer than the Rhine Valley. So today, with, through the efforts of thousands of people in almost two centuries, the predictions have come true. And the Salinas Valley is an agricultural powerhouse, the salad bowl of the nation. So thank you. I do want to mention that uh, the photographs uh, that I use today, many of them are from the Monterey County Parks Department's collection, 
as well as Monarch County Historical Society and the library. And I do have brochures up here that were produced by the um, Monterey County Historical Commission. They're driving tours, historic driving tours. So we have one on Big Sur, one on Old Stage Road, and one on River Road, if you're interested. So thank you. <laughs>